Kia, thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate you taking time out of your, uh, say, busy schedule, but I'm not quite sure that that's the right, right term right now. Um, Mate, you're, uh, you're an oasis of something to do in uh, the boredom of uh, Corona. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, well, I appreciate that at least. And uh, look, for those people that maybe haven't heard of you, aren't signed up to the Strengths Coach Network, okay? <laughs> there you go. Um, why don't you just give us a quick overview of um, kind of who you are and uh, your journey? So the journey I usually tell people is uh, wanted to be an athlete, realized I was five foot ten, chubby, slow and white <laughs> with, no, with no skill and uh, not mentally good enough to be an athlete. And um, you know, I, was, I always found that academics easy at school. So in, in the midst of uh, trying to address those genetic factors that we just discussed, I kind of developed an enthusiasm for training and decided to go do sports science at university. I went to Leeds, graduated 2008. Um, around the summer of 2008, I realized that I'd spent three years becoming a researcher, not a coach, and then spent two years of uh, working as a self-employed personal trainer, doing a master's degree and failing to get the opportunity to work for free. Um, so yeah, a lot of improvement had to take place during that time. Um, thankfully, in 2011, oh no, 2010, um, a guy named Ian Taplin at London Wasps took pity on me and allowed me to work for him for free. And I moved down to London and started working at Wasps. And since then, I've, for the most part, worked in various codes of rugby. I kind of rose up the ladder at London Wasps. I, I did a year working for free. I did a year as the number two in the academy, which I figured out the numbers was about five grand below the poverty line in London. Um, then I was appointed head of academy in 2012. I threw my toys out the pram because it wasn't the job that I wanted. It was, a, it was a very good job. Um, you know, looking back at the age that I was when I was doing it, it was still a good job. But my, my mindset was that I felt like I'd got a bit of a consolation prize and I didn't want to be pigeonholed. So I went to Rotherham knowing that I was going to move to Australia. So I did a, a temporary stint at Rotherham to put adult rugby on my, my CV, my resume, um, moved to Australia because I thought if I'm going to be poor, I'll be poor with a tan. <laughs> and then when I got there, I, my, my career just undertook a very sharp increase, uh, not through anything that I'd done in Australia, but through seeds that I had planted without knowing where they were going to go before that. So I quickly... Um, got appointed to fulfill a temporary contract for Exos with Argentina Rugby. Uh, I did that for the Rugby Championship for 2013. And off the back of that, it basically started the process of me getting hired by Sydney Roosters to be their head of academy um, in the, it would be the, the English autumn winter of 2013. And within three weeks, I'd, I'd actually risen up to be the, the first grade speed strength and power coach for the Sydney Roosters. Um, that was a disaster. So I resigned and went back to Argentina and that culminated in the 2015 World Cup. There was some contractual stuff where I wanted to stay, but I couldn't. So I went off to get paid in uh, Japan for two years and midway through that, I thought this is enough rugby for me. So I switched my objective to try and work in the NFL and, and, start again in the States and I've been in the States since um, January 18. So started out at the University of Richmond. I was on the, you know, across everything there, Olympic assistant, football assistant, basically the bottom guy. Um, not, not to brag, but just to demonstrate to people that I do, I, I am interested in the work. The pay cut that I took from Tokyo to Richmond was in excess of 200 grand a year. Um, started again there. And then in the summer of 18, a uh, very nice man by the name of Eric Corum took pity on me and uh, asked me to come to William and Mary with him because they had health insurance there and I was having a baby. <laughs> and now I'm the, I'm the coordinator of football performance at, at William and Mary. Well, that's a quite, quite a journey, obviously, like around the world, many different jobs and then dabbling in obviously Olympic sports as well, just to, to prove that you're not the rugby guy as your little bio that stays here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So how is that, how's that transition been from rugby 
like your first love, I suppose, to, to football. Two contact sports, obviously, but completely different. They are, yeah. Um, yeah. There's real similarities and there's, there's real differences. Um, you know, the similarity for any sport, any field-based sport is all athletes have to be able to, to run, jump and change direction. And if you're in rugby, they have to be able to hit. So those are the similarities. And truthfully, the, the number of coaches that can analyze in great detail and reverse engineer the demands of all of those in either sport are not that numerous. Um, so to that extent, they have that in common. And I, I you know, it's... Uh, not arrogant but like i think i'm good at that stuff so i found it reasonably easy to transfer that and say well you know okay this is the same in football we need to work on this 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 but then learning the the different cultural issues that you have to come you have to get around uh the the rhythm of the week the rhythm of the year the different challenges you know pro rugby to collegiate is very very different there's no such thing as spring ball in rugby for a good reason because it's absolutely nuts. <laughs> you know, just all these different things and just, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And, you know, things like intricacies of positions, different, different routes that they can run in the field, uh, getting, getting a feel for what's important for each person and, and how you reverse engineer stuff like that. That's, I'm sure I'll never stop learning at that, but that's been the biggest learning experience for me. And what do you think within that you mentioned obviously like the reverse engineering of the game? What's the biggest thing that you think you've you've brought to William and Mary? Um not me personally, but with Eric. Uh -huh. If this is the thing, if you sit down a sport coach or an athlete and walk them through a series of yes no questions and lead them down the garden path logically and then ask them to reconcile what they've just agreed to with the course of action they've taken, you're going to see confusion. So for example, you know, you, you put yourself in the, in the, the, the position of the athlete or the coach, would you agree with the statement that how you approach training for your sport should be directly related to the demands of your sport? Yes. Okay. Define the demands of your sport. No, they just like, that's where it ends. That's where it ends. So, so you're, you're literally having those, those conversations. You're like, okay, coach. Of course. Tell me the demands of your sport. And you're trying to, yeah. not, you, you don't want to embarrass them. How are you going about that conversation? Because some coaches could it, Typically, it, it does end in embarrassment a lot of the time. Because one of the biggest transformations in terms of a sport coach at our institution, he's, this guy is awesome. It was actually prior to me arriving, but... Eric had sat down with this, this coach. He was new as well. A tremendous enthusiasm, it, just an awesome guy, awesome worker. And he, he basically started to have this conversation that, I, that I'm having with you now. I said, right, okay, define, you know, how long is a typical play? And the sport coach said, I don't know. I said, okay, how long is a typical rest? And he goes, I don't know. How many plays in a set? I don't know. What's the rest between sets? I don't know. And he literally wrote in an email to Eric, I know nothing about my sport. Now, that's when governing dynamics of coaching came out, all these books, and basically Eric walking this guy through how to reverse engineer the demands of his sport. And less than a year later, or maybe a little bit over a year later, he and I sat down. He handed me all of this research on the time motion demands of collegiate volleyball, and we looked at well, what are the biodynamics and so on. And we developed in one day a volleyball specific test that replicates not only the bio um, dynamics, but the, the, the bioenergetics because the time motion demands are the same of collegiate volleyball. And nobody else has got that. It was that, that's almost for that coach, especially that's a light bulb moment. It's just like, uh, that's going off and he's like, oh shit. Like, yeah. No, nothing number one. But then as soon as you realize nothing, that's, that's the time you can just start absorbing yeah. Now imagine if he'd waited 20 years for that to happen. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of coaches out there that, if, that you know, that I, I've been coaching this amount of time. Well, okay, then you should know your game inside out. Mm -hmm. And if you, want, if you ask those questions, the answer is, of course, no.
And is that a conversation that you're able to have across all sports or is that no. something that you've just got to allow to, to naturally occur? No. Um, there, there are, there's good and bad to every environment. Okay. What is bad about the American collegiate system and American professional sport in general is that the strength coach is seen to work for the sport coach not with the sport coach and in order to um, change that dynamic you you need one physical preparation coaches or high performance coaches that are willing to speak truth to power mm -hmm. so you have to you have to be you have to one be confident in what you're talking about and know what you're talking about. Two, you have to operate in a system that's going to give you the security to do so. And on the flip side, it needs sport coaches that are okay with saying, I don't know, and putting aside ego, because you know, strength coaches have ego too. So the sport coaches, everyone has ego mm -hmm. to be able to put aside the ego and say, actually, I don't know. I'm more interested in finding out the answer to this question than protecting my ego. And then this is why administration is so important to have an admin that says from the top down, this is how we're going to do it. And you have to listen to this person and this person has to listen to this person and so on. And if you look at the worst examples of, of American um, sport culture, you work for the head coach. The head coach is always right. And they'll tell you, this is what I want and it's your job to give it to me. And again, people have a habit of orienting their behavior towards what gets rewarded. And the setup is, is such in a lot of institutions that what gets rewarded is not rocking the boat and being so-and-so's guy. Whereas good institutions will ring fence performance staff outside of sport coaches and sport teams. So for example, you're the tennis guy, you're hired by Wake Forest, to be the physical preparation coach for tennis and that head coach cannot touch you. Mm -hmm. And the head coach comes in and they say to the head coach, this is your performance coach, work with him. And that's one thing at the administrative level that has to happen in order to give people the security to have those kind of conversations. Because when the person that you are telling objectively, you are wrong or you do not know this, signs your check, you're going to get very timid very quick. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I think that obviously happens within, within football, football and basketball, yeah, football <laughs> and basketball essentially. And um, then it makes, it's obviously harder for the S and C coach to make more of an impact at that point. As soon as you're scared that I oh, shit, like if I don't say what he yeah. wants to hear, then I'm going to leave yeah. my job. And here's another thing. Schools and administrators are wary of doing this because if you have a list of candidates and eight of them have their guy that they want to bring with them and you say, no, you're going to have this guy. Mm -hmm. You immediately whittle down the list of candidates that you're able to offer a job to. If that's one of their conditions. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. 100%. And it's such a, it's such an interesting, but I think it's well potentially the right way to go, obviously, because it's going to give more protection to the strength and conditioning profession instead of you just being in and out of a job at the, at the drop of a hat, you know? Yeah. That's one thing, you know, I wrote a note to myself in the last year where it's best people. So you have to get the best people. So you have to, you have to, you have to incentivize people to come and work for you. Then it's best pro productivity, which is clear the plate of any BS that has nothing to do with them winning games in the field. And then it's, it's longest tenure. If, if you assume that everyone is going to make X percent improvement per year, it's in your interest to keep coaches for as long as possible. If you think about like it's topical right now, the last dance, yep. how long was that staff in place for a long time? You know, you, you have to be in place for a long time in order to achieve audacious goals mm -hmm. and you have to be hyper-focused and hyper-productive. And then you look at the nature of um, strength and conditioning in, in America, pro and collegiate, they're highly incentivized, but then there's a lot of BS that they have to do that has nothing to do with winning games and it's musical chairs. Yeah. It's just a revolving door. 
and then, it's, it's at odds with the stated objective of the organization. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, slightly off topic here, but I know you've done a little bit of work with, uh, with Arsenal and Des Ryan, I believe. I, pr- so, I presented there, yeah. Yeah, so, and I know they've got a pretty good academy system and their system kind of, you start at the bottom, work your way up and you recycle back to the bottom to your most experienced coach, presumably your best Howdy coach. Right. Yeah, starts back at the bottom and then yeah. develop again. Like, can you, can you just talk a little bit about that and that, how maybe that ties in as well? I mean, I can't speak to to that. I didn't. I didn't really speak to Des about that. Um, but one one thing that that struck me about speaking to Des, the first thing he came he did when he came in, mm-hmm. was make everyone a permanent employee of the club. Right. So it's not you have a contract for one two years. We're getting rid of you. The next guy comes in. It's you are an employee of Arsenal Football Club. Exactly what we just talked about. Yeah. So now it's like, we can't get rid of you. We're going to develop you and you're going to, ri- you're going to rise up through this organization. Yeah. And if you yeah. go, it's because you got offered an amazing job elsewhere. And it's like, you know, you, you go with our blessing. Yeah, it's a reflection on the company as well. Absolutely. Port Adelaide Football Club. Darren Burgess came in and gave everyone a five-year contract. Wow. Which is unheard of in sport. Yeah. But it's like, this, you know, just a real, real quick aside as well. Speaking to my boss this year, we, we, we were talking. I said, basically you're forced to realize there's two times that you can ask for change in money in an organization. One is when you're so new that you can't be fired. And two is when you've won. Right. So Darren Burgess came in expensive coach, new momentum, couldn't be fired. And he's right. Give him, 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 him a five-year contract. Try doing that midway through a deal. Yeah, you know? <laughs> that's, that's putting your cards out on the table from the start, you know, but that's the thing It's like, you're the organization you've told me this is your stated objective and i am the expert who's tasked with achieving that here are three things that i think are absolutely uncompromisable in order to achieve that are you going to make it happen for me no we're not going to make it happen okay stop saying you're about this then if you are then give me the changes i want <laughs> at the end of it yeah no, that's a that's a great insight as well yeah. um going back to kind of william and mary and things like that i know you you presented a few times this year um, on the, the tribe test. Yeah. Do you mind getting into the details behind that, kind of what it is? Sure. Um, how did it come about? Because I know, obviously, football has been a bit archaic in terms of, oh, we love 110s, we love 300s and half yeah. gases and all, and all this stuff. Like, yeah. can you, I, you can go to town on this one. You can go yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one. Like, let's just say, like, why that? I know we talked off air a little bit about repeat sprint testing. Yeah. Um, Let's, let's really get into the meat of that and why potentially there's, there's a better way. Okay. So this is like getting right into the weeds. Of, have, you ever, have you ever read a, oh, what's the book? I forget. It's by Judea Pearl, but it's basically about how do you create knowledge? Okay. Like causal inference. So in, in order to create knowledge and really any, any decision-making, any piece of knowledge that you acquire as a human being, you're making a prediction about the future. I believe if, the, if X happens, Y will be the result. Correct? Yep. Okay. Now, people love to shoot down correlation, say correlation is not causation, which is very, very true. Ice cream consumption goes up in the summer, so does murder. Does that mean if you go out, out and buy ice cream, people are going to die? No. Does that mean if you murder someone, people are going to buy ice cream? No. <laughs> there's, a, there's a hidden third variable, which is the heat. Okay, so as the heat rises up, those two things rise. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at causal inference, one of the things that must exist is a correlation. One thing rises or falls with another. And there's other criteria that allow you to, you know, determine if something really does cause another, like uh, chronology. A causes B, or A A precedes B. Dose response, more of A equals more of B, and so on. Okay? So... Correlation must exist for causation. So that means the more closely associated performance in a test and performance on the field are, the more predictive value they have. Okay? And that's basically what we want. You and I as coaches want to say, if he does well on this, he's going to do well on the field. So... What is correlation in exercise? Specificity. Yep. That's basically it, right? If you look at Bondichuk's work, 
the more closely correlated an exercise is with performance in the sport, the more specific it is considered to be. And the less correlation it has, the more general it is considered to be. doesn't mean you don't train the, the general stuff. Yep. You have to do it early in the career and keep that ace up your sleeve. Okay. So the stronger the correlation between exercise and test, the more specific it is. What are the criteria established by Verkashansky that makes an exercise more or less specific? Range of motion, uh, peak amplitude of force production, contact time, angular velocity, regime of muscular work, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Broadly, it's going to be what are the movements that you have to do in the field of play? What are the physical qualities that underpin that? And what are the bioenergetics? What are the energy systems taxed by that sport or event? So it's really hard to define the exact contribution of each energy system because the, the research is always being updated. But would you agree that a task that as closely as possible replicates the time motion demands of football is going to tax the energy systems as closely as possible as football? Mm -hmm. Which means there's going to be a high correlation between performance in the test and performance on the field which means it has high predictive value, yeah. which means it's useful. Okay, so if you take that logic and you say, okay, the more distinct the test is, so my email's just gone off, can you still see me? Yep. Cool. The more distinct a test is in terms of the time motion demands to the sport, the more differently it is going to tax the energy pathways and the less correlation is going to be between the test and the event. Agree? Mm -hmm. Which means it has less predictive value, yep. which means it's less useful. Yeah. Okay. What are the demands of football? Roughly. Just over five seconds in play. Very, very high intense activity. Just over 35 seconds out of play because of the play clock for an average of just under seven plays per series and then you get an 11 minute rest on average because there's you know all these interruptions in in football you get um you know official timeouts media timeouts all that kind of stuff okay so you look at those time motion demands now look at a 300 yard show what's the what's the time in play of a 300 yard show 60 seconds what's the time between plays well if you do two it's about 180 seconds how many, of you, how many are you doing? Two. Is, is that close to football? No. Is it likely to have predictive value for football? No. Okay. Look at half gasser. 18 seconds. Out and back. Rest period, 45 seconds or so. Too long. How many reps do you do? A lot of teams are patting themselves on the back for doing 18, 20, 22 half gasses. Grossly in excess of the demands of football. And what people instinctively do is they will lower their output level to survive that test. Mm -hmm. So even if it looks a little bit like football, the outputs that you're achieving will be lower than the sport of football. And also teams will just go 15, 16, 17, 18, and the boys will pace themselves to cross in the minimum time that they're allowed. So it doesn't make sense. And then the 110 is just atrocious because it's too long. It's not maximal. And I'll say this about gym testing. If we went into the gym and I asked you to lift a barbell of arbitrary load, would you have any inference as to my maximal strength? So if the test isn't maximal, you're not measuring the capacity of the athlete. Yeah. Is a 110 maximal? So what are we measuring? We're measuring completion. Yeah. All, you, all you're measuring is, did he finish the test or not? So coming in, this is, this is where I think maybe... I've been able to, there's two things. I'm not afraid of looking like an idiot and speaking out. And also I've never worked in football before. So I'm looking at these tests and I'm like speaking to Eric, why are we doing this? Why does it look like this? And we're going back and forth. And then Patrick Ward at the, the Seahawks very kindly sent me a bunch of research when I started working in football. I said, you know, if you work in football, you know football, send me what I need to know. And he sent me all this stuff. And I ended up devising the, the tribe test with Eric off the back of that. So the tribe test is, because we're up tempo, five seconds, maximum distance, 25 seconds rest, times 12. So goal line to goal line drive. Is it more than seven plays? Yes, it is. But 
worst case scenario, in most games you're going to hit a, a, a peak number of um, plays per drive of about 12. Um, so that, would, that was the rationale behind it. Now, in terms of the, the detail of the test, start on the goal line, sprint out to the 20, cut and come back to cover as much distance as possible. And the reason for that was obviously there's changes of direction in football. So adding that axle D-cell component is probably more representative of the, the movement demands of the sport. And obviously when you limit the distance that they can run at top speed, you reduce the risk on hamstrings a little bit. So would I be okay with linemen running repeat 40s you know, every, every 30 seconds? No. So we set it at 20 yards because our fastest guys are never going to get out to 20 and back to the goal line in five seconds. And our slowest guys can always get to the 20 in five seconds. Yeah. So that was the happy medium between that. And if you look at the data, the traditional tests, and I pick on the 110, the 300, the, the half gasser, we just said, truthfully, the 110 does not give you any actionable information whatsoever. It measures, did you do the test? Yeah. Because you're not measuring capacity and you're not measuring time or anything like that. If you measure the 300, if people don't, you're measuring something that doesn't have any you know, predictive value, in my opinion, for football. Same with the half gasser. Whereas with this test, we can measure to the yard the total that they do over 12 reps. So we can infer peak energy system capacity no. to the yard. We can, we can know, okay, we used to be here, now you're here. The, the program has worked and improved this much. We can also look at peak power in that first rep, okay? And maybe we can compare that to linear speed. Mm -hmm. Is your output in linear speed representative of your output in change of direction speed? If so, maybe you don't have a change of direction deficit. If it isn't, maybe you do. And then we can also look at stuff like fatigue decrement that you mentioned off the air. So if you, you know, do, do you have a really, really good peak output? Yes, you do. Okay, but then you drop off a cliff. Well, that tells us maybe that you need to look at either technique or aerobic capacity work to, to address that deficit. When you do a 110, a 300 or a half gasser, you don't come away with any information other than he passed the test. And then what happens is the, the kids that pass, you pat them on the back. The kids that fail, you MF them, make them do extra work. And why, why do you think there's this kind of, is it a disconnect with coaches or, or what is it? Why are these tests still being done then if, if they don't have any predictive value? What do you think the reason behind that might be? Is that because the sports coach, is it the sports coach kind of wants it still that we talked about earlier, the kind of the system? That uh, no, no, I think laziness or fear either people are so lazy that they just copy what they did as a player or what they learn as an assistant under somebody else the fear maybe of trying a test that fails yeah. or changing the way things have always been done uh there's, there's a fear associated with that maybe not having fresh eyes as to a situation and football culture unquestionably has this relationship tied in its head where pain equals effectiveness and we we told our guys coming in we're going to run a test that requires you to run for five seconds maximally rest 25 seconds and repeat for 12 reps and they were like that sounds way easier than 300s bring it on dude the first time we did that tribe test it was like a bomb had gone off just body strewn all over the place. And now we like our freshmen come in and they get nervous about this test. Really? Yeah. Because this is the thing. If you know you've got 18 reps and all I'm doing is making a note of whether you completed it or not, what are you going to do? You're going to run at the minimum speed possible that allows you to complete that rep. Survival so, mode. Yeah. You're going you're gonna to produce lactate. No doubt. You're going to produce lactate, but you're, you're going to, you're not going to produce maximal lactate. Mm -hmm. If I say to you, I am going to measure to the yard what you do every single rep and so help you, that total at the end of 12 reps better be significantly above what you did last time. How much lactate do you think you're going to produce? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, how then are you, are you measuring like the yards covered? Are you recording the whole thing and watching it back and doing yeah. it that way? No, no, no. We, we, do it, we do it live. So we have a scoring sheet. Uh -huh. 
that has the, the number of yards covered. So anything above 20, 21, 22, blah, 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 up to 40. Okay. If I run the test, you are my spotter. Yep. So you are going to stand a couple of yards to the side of me and you're going to make a note of the line that I cross every single rep and circle that number. Mm -hmm. That sheet comes back to me and Scott. We add up the scores. We look at the peak. We look at the fatigue decrement and that's your score. Yeah. So it requires a little bit of coaching mm -hmm. to the athletes, but if you can count and you can stand at the appropriate line, because if, if for example, if you cross the 10 every single rep, am I going to stand on the five? No, I'm going to stand <laughs> on the 10. So I basically have, I have a really good view of like, Oh, Chris did 29. He did 31. He did 28 kind of thing. And do you find it took almost like them running through the test? the first time to kind of understand that or did you have to coach that up on the front end just to make sure that we coached was... it on the front end yeah. um and obviously i think there's an implicit learning of the test and the pacing mm -hmm. you know even even if a test is maximal desensitizing them to the sensation of going maximally is going to improve the test so we kind of, we, we took it on the chin of, okay, well, between the first time and the second time they ran the test, we'll take it and just, you know, chalk up to learning. But the, the values continue to go up. Our, our tribe test scores actually went up during the season. And then we, you know, we, we had uh, freshman athletes that were naive to that, that still posted good scores. So it was, it was you know, it's, it's hard to isolate one variable, but it's, it suggests to us that we're on the right track in terms of conditioning and the, the test is, is valid. So when you say that the test scores went up in season, I'm guessing you, were you testing in season or was that no. the, the, the... No, just, just before Christmas. Or? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we, we, uh, we, we record that test just prior to Christmas in order to have a stick to beat them with when they get back. Fair enough. Good, good enough to <laughs> <Karen> somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And are you just one final question there on the tribe test, just out of interest? Are you marking the guys? It's like torso kind of position, or is it like where's the foot, foot placement? Foot, foot placement. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, just moving on now, I want to talk a little bit about max strength. Yeah. Now, I know you've kind of put a lot of stuff out there on Instagram and, and put a few like opinions out there. Like you say, you're not you're not afraid to put your head above the parapet. Um, but what is it with max strength? There's obviously this huge fascin fascination with it. Everyone loves seeing huge weights being thrown around. It's like everyone gets after it. It's it's good fun. Like everyone loves like lifting. Yeah. But is it as important as we like we once thought? No. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is where again knowledge and epistemology and all that like all that, that kind of philosophy of do I know or am I guessing? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can get somebody to agree uh, in kind of like theoretical terms. You say, do you think it would be appropriate to take the findings of one small research group uh, of a population that looks nothing like the people that you, you work with over a tiny space of time and they're at a completely different stage of their career and then apply it to all athletes or, you know, to all, or to all groups everywhere over a period of years and years and years. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Okay. Now we take as gospel maximal strength improves everything. Yeah. Do you, do you know that? Have you run the numbers on your athletes to show that there is a significant correlation between maximal strength or maximal relative strength? and the things that we hold to be important. Most field sport athletes, especially the non-contact ones, if you say, if you had to write down on a postcard what it is you want to improve, they'll say acceleration, top speed, jumping, and cutting. Now, cutting is hard to measure. Jumping and sprinting are easy to measure. Mm -hmm. Now, people will tell me maximal strength improves this stuff. And I'll say, well, I ran the numbers on my guys, and guess what, it doesn't. There is no, when I've run the numbers, every time I've run the numbers, no correlation between maximal strength or relative strength and acceleration or jumping. The jumps do predict sprinting and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Strength is not. So does, does that mean strength does not benefit sprinting and jumping? No. 
it means it just stops benefiting it with the population that I work in right now under these circumstances. And is that so something in, where you'll run the numbers within those different like populations that you kind of work with and see yeah. what that is? Because say we're working yeah. with, is a two point uh, times body weight, a two times body weight back score better than a 1.7? Like in, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Mm -hmm. If you are working with college age, moderately trained recreational athletes that never do any kind of sprinting or sprint mechanics works, do you think it is going to be more beneficial to squat double body weight compared to 1.7? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that is not most athletes. Yeah. Yeah. And what this is, this is the same argument that you see with Olympic lifting a little bit. The Olympic lifts cure cancer. No, they don't. They're just useful for this reason, this reason, this reason. You know, I think they're useful because no inherent deceleration, triple extension under load, appropriate velocity. Oh, well, they still train coordination. It starts to get a little bit more nebulous. Oh, well, it still helps with force absorption in, in the catch. Oh, well, you only need the, the, the second pull. The goalposts start to move. Mm -hmm. So it used to be maximal strength cures cancer. It helps you do this, this, and this. No, it doesn't. Only, only up to about a 1.7 body weight squat in FBS football. Oh, well, it gives you general robustness. Well, no, it doesn't because, one, if you have a 2.5 um, times body weight back squat, you're a population of one. So if you stay healthy for the year, guess what? Oh, if you squat above two and a half times body weight, you have a 100% chance of staying healthy. It's like saying, look at the cases of chickenpox in people above seven feet tall. There's way lower than the rest of the population because yeah, there's less of them. Yeah. Yeah? And then it becomes, well, it, it's, it's just a moving goalpost. Ultimately, if there is a correlation, there is a direct relationship between improving that variable and improving performance in the sport. If there is not, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And if I said to you, well, you have a limited number of hours per week, a limited amount of energy, and a limit, limited amount of things that you can do per week to improve performance on the field, would you spend a majority of your time on stuff that does not have a relationship? No. So the, the mental barrier that people have to get over in order to do two or three sets, two sets of strength work in a session and then spend an hour and a half on sprints and ballistic power work and jumps, the confidence to make that decision and to stand in front of a group of football athletes, for example, and say that with a straight face, that's where it can be difficult. And how have you approached that with like the athletes and the coaches and things as well? Is that, is that being difficult? I asked them how much their verticals improved or their broad has improved or how much their speed has improved in the last year. <laughs> and, and I say, I say, who's the strongest person in the team? And they'll pick a player. I say, right, is he the fastest? No. Does he jump the furthest? No. So, right. Should I make him stronger? Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> your answer. And do you think that comes with the, to an extent, like the more is better approach. Like people yeah. think that maybe, oh, you need to be like seven five or over seven foot to play in the Senate, the the, uh, the NBA. Like the taller is better. But in matter of fact, you only need to be I don't know what it is. I think six seven or something to play in the NBA. Muggsy Bogues was six uh, was five three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. And that's that's the thing. It's not taller is better. It's not necessarily like that's not the approach you need to go for. It's it's finding what is that that minimal kind of threshold, like the one point seven. Uh, Pay the price of entry. Exactly, yeah. The price yeah. of entry is, is paid, and now we can work on the stuff that matters. So Correct. Skill development and that sort of stuff. But this is the thing. It's, uh, if you read Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow by Kahneman, we have these biases, and one of them is substitution bias. I ask you a complicated question. Subconsciously, you substitute that for something that you find easier to answer, and you return that answer to me. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, strength and conditioning in a nutshell. How do you improve conditioning? Conditioning is a really complex interaction between uh, internal and external feedback to the brain and the brain running a constant calculation about how much more of this can I tolerate before I expose myself to irreparable damage associated with activity. Mm -hmm. All these different factors, mechanical, psychological, environmental, biochemical, all that kind of stuff. And we've just replaced it in our head with how do you make someone's VO2 max go up? VO2 max. 
doesn't even correlate with performance in elite runners. Once you, once you pay the price of entry, does VO2 max distinguish between performance? No, that's what the Russians found out. And yet we're still doing VO2 max grids. <laughs> Same with strength and speed. We will, you know, strength. We've taken a really complex question of how do you increase outputs in jumping and sprinting and replace it subconsciously with how do you make somebody squat more and clean more? And do you think it's, so it's essentially just being dumbed down to being like, okay, let's try and find, well, a simple answer to a complex problem. Of course. And when, when your job, when I have told you your job is to make them better. And if you do a good job on this, I'm going to, I'm going to reward you and give you a pay rise and your job is secure subconsciously you are going to hang your hat on the stuff that is one easiest to measure mm -hmm. and two easiest to improve. Yeah. Is it, is it difficult from the mid teens to adulthood to double a kid's back squat? No. Yeah. Is it, diff is it near impossible to double their sprint speed? Yeah. <laughs> which are you going to hang your hat on then? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But which is going to make the difference in the, in the sport? Exactly. Yeah. If you, if you get a 10% improvement in speed across a career, pat yourself on the back. Yeah. But when you have somebody across town being like, well, I, I increased this kid's back squat by hundred percent. Well, good for you. If you don't have the expertise to see the difference between the two and understand the impact of the two, who is the, who is the layman administrator or head coach going to want to work with? Yeah. Not, not to mention when if, if you adopt a high performance mindset and look at all of the variables that influence performance, let's look at conditioning. Does efficiency of skill impact conditioning? Unquestionably. Mm -hmm. Does tactical scheme and uh, unforced errors influence conditioning? No question. Mm -hmm. Does nutrition influence it? No question. Does training influence it? No question. Okay. But when they're not appearing to be well conditioned, I'm coming for you. When in reality, it's like, well, actually they made these list of unforced errors. And when I tried to do uh, efficiency work in this, 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 I was told to stay in my lane. So this is why if you're, if you're really honest about it, strength and conditioning does not exist. Yeah. It's more one area of specialization compared to another, but everything affects everything. And you cannot exist in a silo because if you do, it's almost a trap because you're saying, judge me on this particular outcome, 80% of the factors of which you do, you do not have any control over mm -hmm. because you've, you've had that role delineated for you. So in reality, you, the onus is on you to redefine what your role is and to break down the barriers about what you can influence. I always use the analogy, you know, you're from the UK. When you, used to go, <clears throat> when you used to go to the supermarket as a kid, there would be like one of those fake toy cars outside. You put 20p in and you'd sit and it would go around like this. <laughs> when you're five years old, you think you're driving the car. That's what strength and conditioning is to high performance sport. You think you're driving the car. In reality, you're not. The head coach put in 20p and you're sat around going like this, patting yourself on the back for how good a job you're doing. It's how much you can ha essentially have an effect on the coach and almost, like you say, you don't want to necessarily stay in your lane, but you've got to somehow bridge that gap. And it's like, yeah. you know, James Smith talks about like strength yeah. conditioning to an extent is dead. If you're going to do the best. It doesn't job. exist. Yeah. You're just going to try and merge everything together. Yeah. How much can we do you that? think Darren Burgess, David Joyce, Des Ryan, Dan Howes, Buddy Morris, all these people, do you think they have been as successful as they have based on their ability to write a weight room program or their ability to coordinate people within an organization and influence members of that staff to take decisions which are in their own best interest. Yeah, number two. But why, why are we stood at conferences arguing about, well, I think this squat program's better. Well, I think this is better. It doesn't matter. <laughs> 100%. And so, so on that kind of identification of I know like moving back a little bit of like training parameters and what's more important and, and what's not 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, did you come up with yourself and maybe Eric, I'm not sure, um, come up with like an algorithm to identify some of these like important factors, key performance indicators to an extent and kind of, so we can improve these individual factors for our athletes? Trying to, trying to, whether, whether it works or not remains to be seen, especially now because, you know, things have got in the way, but yeah. the, the, the thinking was, was tying in a, a few different things. So I've got this book here this uh, thinking in systems yep so it talks about and uh, maladin talks about it in this one yep. so he talks about the law of the minimum so imagine if you're filling up a barrel and there's like staves in a barrel if one of those staves is shorter than anything else does it serve you to try and make the the 10 that are tall higher or do you have to address the shortest one you have to address the shortest one because until you address that limiting factor in the system, you're not going to be able to fill up the barrel higher than it is. Yep. Okay. That's true of athletic performance. Somewhere within the system, you can, you can look at it at a global level, physically, tactically, technically, psychologically, there will be a limiting factor. You and I know there are kids out there that are look like Tarzan, play like Jane. If you have one, and it will be, you know, we need to get this kid bigger and make him squat more. No, he needs to learn how to not be a mental midget. That's what's holding him back. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't have the expertise or it's not your role to do that, that's okay. But you can go a level deeper and you can say, physically, where is that limiting factor? Is it uh, physical qualities? Is it central nervous system output? Is it bioenergetics? If it is that particular area, go a level deeper. Okay, where within those qualities is the limiting factor? And this is, of course, going to be influenced by what the position or sport demands. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be influenced by the degree to which those qualities transfer or the degree to which you have to earn the right to train those qualities in an athlete's career. Because it can be a little bit misleading to say, for example, well, this kid needs, this kid is, two standard deviations below his position average for speed. We're going to train nothing but speed. But if he's horrendously out of shape, you know, like fat, yeah. if he has no appreciable muscle mass, no, he, he can't squat a 1.7 body weight squat, for example. We know that there are things that we have to tick off in order to earn the right to do that. And it's actually going to indirectly, by training that stuff, we improve speed without training speed directly. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of things of, we're making the assumption <clears throat> that there are limiting factors physically within the system right now. It's just an assumption. We are making the assumption that there are bare minimums that athletes must hit in order to be viable at the level that they play at. And that's going to vary by whatever level that you play at. Would we be using the numbers that we have now for a, a, you know, a power five program or an SEC program? Absolutely not. Because the numbers you need to hit to hang in the SEC are way higher. Yep. But we know from our stuff, we say, okay, do we believe that this guy, this guy, this guy are good enough to play FCS football, the level that we play? Yes, we do. Okay, well, let's look at the, the average qualities that these kids possess. And we'll do a normal distribution of that. And we say, the, the closer you can get to this mean value for that population, the less likelihood, in our opinion, that it's going to be a limiting factor the more to the, the downside that you lie in the tails of that distribution, the less likely it is that you're going to come from that population, which means that you can't hang. Yeah. Okay. If you can take more on the front end, take more on, you know, if you can take more on the, the upper end, take more on the upper end, but then it obviously with competing abilities and physical preparation, it can be, you've, you've gone so far in, in this direction that it becomes a limiting factor elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's basically a, a series of statements or assumptions that we're making about the sport of football in order to decide where we're going to put our resources for those athletes. So do we, do we agree with the statement that there is a minimum level of anthropometrics um, that an athlete must achieve in order to be viable in college football? Yes. You're not going to do it at five foot one. You're not going to do it at body weight of 130 pounds. You're not going to do it being grossly overweight. So we we can't really change <clears throat> once they arrive we can't change anthropometrics you recruit anthropometrics does he have 
uh, a skeletal structure that we feel is going to have be able to hold a high level of lean mass. You can look at joint uh, girths, you can look at shoulder width, you can look at seated height, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that, okay, what's the body composition like? Are you going to be, you know, successful in college football if you are falling out of your jersey? With the exception of linemen, no. Okay, so we can then address that because that improves everything else. Same with muscle mass. Muscle mass improves robustness, it improves strength, and which improves speed. And it's like it's the first piece of the puzzle that has to be in place. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that, you know, to contradict myself a little bit, you asked me about maximal strength. Does maximal strength help everything? Yes, it does. When you're new to training and up until this limit. Okay, so can they hit those limits? If they can't, maybe there's a little bit more that we can take advantage of, and then we'll train them up to that. Once they've done that, we know that there's a stronger correlation between uh, the area under the force time curve rather than peak force in performance of sprinting, jumping, cutting, all that kind of stuff that we feel is important for sport. Are they able to get within a standard deviation of their position average for power output? If the answer is no, maybe that's the limiting factor and we should address that. And then if they can do that, are they able to achieve the kind of peak speeds that we need for this position? If not, okay, maybe that's the limiting factor and we need to train that directly. So at every uh, phase, you're, you're becoming progressively more specific in your approach, which means that there's going to be more transfer or you've, you've used up the stuff that's, that's going to transfer early in the career. You're laying a foundation for what comes next. And in theory, you've been able to allocate the greatest proportion of your resources towards the biggest limiting factor. I can just, when, when you when you lay it out like that as well it makes so much sense <laughs> it's just it's, like, it's hard to do though because the the logistical challenge that we're going to face with this is if you are a small time program and there's two people on the floor you're trying to run four four five programs at once yeah so this is where team builders come in because i think blue shex talked about this it's like at some point if you don't have the resources to back up what your vision is you're you're almost better served by falling back to a general program because you can you can knock that out of the park but now what we can do is we can program five different programs on team builder have ipads and different racks and basically have like a team leader for each program and then supervise with the help of interns and all that you know other kind of stuff yeah. to to try and realize that but that's the direction that we're trying to go for it and do, do i think most FCS programs are trying to run four or five programs at once. No, that's where we're trying to distinguish ourselves and say, actually, it's easy to talk about. We want to give the right athlete, the right stimulus and the right amount at the right time. It's very, very difficult to do. And I would say in the majority of places that does not happen. Yeah. I think especially obviously within that collegiate environment, it's, it's pretty much get in, get out, like give you, give a general program for everyone, no matter the position, because that's yeah. the easiest thing to coach when you've got 30 athletes in front of you. And that is, that's the thing about, you know, com coming back to culture. This is why administration and organizational culture trumps everything. Mm -hmm. Because if you, you have to have alignment between what you say you value and what you set up to, to achieve that. So if you say we are going to give, right stimulus, right amount, right time, right athlete, all that kind of stuff. That does not align with industrialization of strength and conditioning, get them in, get them out. Outrageous athlete to coach ratios. Do a session, do a session, do a session, do a session. We ourselves label ourselves as a profession. In reality, the system has forced us to become an industry. What is industry characterized by? Maximal efficiency, uh, maximal repeatability, hire the dumbest person you can for the cheapest wages you can, and get them in, get them out. It's the Toyota Corolla versus the Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. One takes half an hour to make, the other takes six months. That's an extreme example, but it's like we, as organizations, have to be really aligned with what we say we're about because sometimes there's a disconnect if, if your goal is elite performance it's going to cost money it's going to cost time and you might have to sacrifice 
attention to the number of sports that you can train. Mm -hmm. If you want to train <clears throat> the highest amount of athletes possible and basically be club sports in disguise, that's fine. But the two don't always necessarily gel. Yeah, no, 100%. And that's a, a really good way of showing it as well with the Rolls Royce versus the Toyota Corolla. Because that's pretty much, for, for the most part, what the, the Corolla is your collegiate system for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> but you go around telling people I'm a Rolls Royce, they're going to think you're an arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just moving on to another question I've got for you here. So you, men you mentioned earlier, just briefly, you mentioned the kind of the term, like being a mental midget. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to get into a little bit of like, what is mental toughness? Why, do, why is it seen as developing mental toughness going through these like grueling conditioning drills or, or, th or things like one tens and stuff like that? Oh, they're great because they develop mental toughness. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> can, you just get, <laughs> can you just get into that a little bit and say like, what is mental toughness? Uh, and how does it, how do we actually improve it? I, I would say you, you need to adopt the same mental processes that you would for, for regular training. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, with, with regular training, uh, wisdom lies in the definition of terms, Socrates, or the beginning of wisdom lies in definition of terms. So how do you precisely define what it is you are trying to achieve? And this kind of ties in with this like David Deutsch thing of a good definition is hard to vary. So for example, if I ask you real quick in physics, what is speed? Distance divided by time, right? Yeah. Is there anybody out there with an alternative theory as to what constitutes speed? No, nah, it is what it is. Yeah. So it's a great definition because it doesn't vary. And when I talk about speed and you talk about speed, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Right. So bad definition. Something that's so simple and concise. Exactly. You're trying to take one thing and boil it down until it cannot be boiled down anymore. And then we have a shared understanding of what it is we're working towards, what it is we're measuring and so on. Yeah. And in physical preparation, <clears throat> however valid or invalid measures may be, we've done a good job of this. What's the definition of maximal strength, maximal load that the muscle can produce against the uh, source of resistance? Of max, maximum force that a muscle can produce against the source of resistance. Okay. Once you've defined what it is you want, then you're going to measure it. Okay. This is your maximal strength. Here's what we think you need to, to achieve in order to, to be productive at this level of sport. Okay. There is a discrepancy between what the sport demands and what you're capable of achieving. We know that there are various training interventions that typically stimulate this quality and develop it to address the discrepancy that we have right now. Here's our plan. We're going to execute the plan. We're going to monitor it and we're going to adjust as we go forward. Yeah. That's, that's basically physical training. Yeah. Okay. Define mental toughness. <laughs> exactly. Right. So nebulous, so multifaceted and so self-defeating. Here's, here's the example I use all the time. Are you familiar with uh, Johnny Hendricks in the UFC? Mm-hmm. Okay, he, he won an NCAA title as a Division One wrestler. Those guys are mentally tough, correct? Depends what you define as mentally tough, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> but you, you, ask, you ask a person on the street, this guy's mentally tough, right? And he'd be like, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you have to be so mentally tough to be a wrestler to, to go through all that grueling conditioning and, and um, competition. Well, that's the interesting thing. Like, sorry to interrupt you there, but um, yeah. interesting thing you say that is because I've spoke to like, uh, some MMA fighters or even football players, and they're like, I tell them I play rugby. I used to play rugby now, and they're like, "Dude, you're fucking crazy." Yeah, and I'm, and I'm like, "What happened like, to me as well?" It's like you get you get kicked in the head for a living, like yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. So here's the thing, right? That that's 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 one aspect I'll come back to in a second. But Johnny Hendricks is mentally tough. You cannot win an NCAA title uh, in wrestling and then go get punched in the face for a living and not be the 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 man on the streets definition of mentally tough. Mm -hmm. Now, do you agree that? discipline self-control the ability to endure tough times is also characteristic of mental toughness or what the average person would term mental toughness yeah okay why is it he can't meet weight for his fights when before he retired he holds the record for like missed weight cuts in the ufc because he couldn't stick to his diet you read about him and he's like this guy cannot stick to a diet it's always like little seeds is this and blah 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 okay is that mental weakness yes 
if you're going to be, if you're going to be really critical of it, ask a man on the street and say, is this guy mentally tough? If he can't stick to his diet to come to turn up for a fight that he's been paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for mm -hmm. mentally weak. Is he simultaneously mentally tough and mentally weak? Those two things don't gel. Okay. So maybe we're talking about more than one thing. So aggression, ability to endure pain, discipline, task, focus, communication, emotional control. So like being able to take, uh, criticism and abuse and all that kind of stuff. These are all various facets of an umbrella term that we term mental toughness. So it's as nebulous as saying, I want to be handsome. What do you mean by handsome? <laughs> okay. So there's that. Second thing is, is that all situations in life, this is what Tony one of my old assistants, I worked with him at Richmond, said to me, he made me realize all human situations that do not kill you with repeated exposure become desensitizing. The more you do it, the less stressful it becomes. Mm -hmm. And this is in Top Dog, a book about competition. They chuck people out of airplanes, hit the ground, get back in the airplane, obviously with a parachute. Chuck them out again and again and again and again. Something like 10 jumps for them to go from 90% of max heart rate to resting, being thrown out of an airplane because that repeated exposure desensitizes them. So to the MMA fighter, a rugby game is a scary, stressful thing because the number of exposures in that environment is zero. Likewise for football, American football and so on. You have, you have to be tough to play in the NFL as a, as a QB and have someone like Jadavian Clowney run at you to take your head off. You know, if you put a UFC fighter in that situation, they're probably not gonna like it and they're gonna certainly if you measure physical arousal, their arousal is going to be through the roof compared to where it would be in, in a fight. Mm -hmm. So habituation to the environment is one of repeated exposure. So it's two things. What do you mean? And basically it's position. It's, it's environment specific. Yeah. So if you take that concept of nebulous term for mental toughness, we're talking about a variety of different qualities like a composite. Okay. If you ask the average sport coach, strength coach, anyone working in sport, define for me precisely what you mean by mental toughness, you're going to come up with silence. Okay. If you can't define it, how are you going to measure it? You can't. Impossible. If you can't measure it, how are you going to understand which environments elicit that particular quality or develop that particular quality? You can't. And if you can't do that, how are you going to come up with a plan to address it? So the best that I've managed to do with mental toughness is define it as the differential between what you can do under conditions of no stress and what you can do under conditions of the most intense stress. The smaller that gap, the more mentally tough you are. It's like a black box. It doesn't really care what's going on in your head. Yeah. But if Usain Bolt's potential is a world record and he sets a world record in the world and Olympic finals, is he mentally tough? Yeah. 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 <laughs> So we, we can attempt to do that though. And this is where I think Eric is excellent. Um, his ability for people that he's worked with organizations he's been is to precisely define the qualities that contribute to mental toughness, to measure them, uh, to track them and try and develop them in a scaled and progressive manner. So it's not just enough like, we're going to put you in a room, you know, if you're a soldier, we're going to put you in a room with flashbang grenades and start shooting over your head. That's the, equi that's the mental equivalent of uh, going into a gym on day one and squatting with 110% of your max. Start with 50%, get the technique right, come in next day, 51, 52, 53, 54, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I was lucky enough to, uh, to meet a couple of guys that were in special operations this year, various stages. One was retired. One's just got in, another one's going through selection right now. And all three of them, they don't know each other. I just ask them all these questions, like hammer them questions. How is it? And it's basically, you start out with something that you can do. Then you make it a little bit harder. You go to the limit of your ability and it gets a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. And you just progress that way. So if you think about the approach that we've just described, reconcile that to what happens in sport there's a disconnect no mm -hmm. and this is the thing would you agree with the idea that 
the more precisely you can define qualities, measure them and track them, the more accurate a model of the world you're working with and the more informed your decisions are going to be. Yeah. Okay. Look at the NFL draft. What are the reasons that a player is typically considered to be a bust? Are they physical, tactical, technical, or psychological? Well, it's based, they're based around a lot of, well, the fact is to do with their, like the combine score as well. Is that building no, no, no. or is that just... No, no, no. I'm talking about when they're in their career. Okay, okay, okay. We're drafting this guy first round, 15th pick, and it doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. What are the reasons it doesn't work out? Because this kid turned out to be not be the physical freak that we thought he was? No. He, we can see he's a physical freak. He goes to the league, he's a physical freak. The breakdown is always going to be, and we can also see what his technique is like. You can see it on film. This technique is really, really good. He's, he's consistently doing this. So it's not physical and it's not tactical. Sorry, it's not technical. They turn out to be a bust because of ability to understand and, and function in the game at that high level or character. Would you agree? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why is that? What, what are the two things that we struggle the most to define and measure? Perfect. Character <laughs> and tactics. <laughs> and this is why I think really the next frontier of high performance is going to be the ability of organizations to define, measure, track, and progressively load those variables. Mm-hmm. Because if you read a book called Zero to One by Peter Thiel, which I've, I've got back into this year, I've read it you know, a bunch of times before, his argument is great businesses and great organizations are built on a secret that you know to be true, but nobody else knows. If you know what I know, you're going to do it and I'm going to do it. And the competitive, the competitive advantage gets competed away. He knew before anybody else, apart from Elon Musk, that the, the union of email and banking was a billion dollar idea. And that's how he built PayPal. All right. So if you know, as an organization, through your proprietary methods of um, defining uh, tracking all these different criteria in a valid manner. If you know that and the other 31 teams don't know that, you're suddenly able to pick out the diamond in the rough in the draft process and say, everyone thinks this kid is a bust. I'm going to pick him. Yeah. And some people can do that instinctively, like uh, Tyron Matthew. Tyron Matthew in college had uh, personal problems, uh, broken home growing up, drug issues in school, actually got kicked out of the program. Now, instinctively, people at the time knew, I think it was, it was Bruce Arians, actually. People at the time, uh, Bruce Arians, instinctively had a hunch. These things don't matter. This, 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 this matter. And now the guy's a Super Bowl MVP. So if you can make every decision you make as an organization, a Tyron Matthew pick, and not, for example, a Jamarcus Russell pick, success is going to be yours. And that's going to be far more impactful to the organization then how do we get them to squat more yeah 100 i mean that, that's fascinating that's just giving me a great the cogs are turning you know that's giving me a great yeah. insight into that whole Mate, mine are turning as well <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah that's great um like i know we're getting on a little bit here and i don't want to take too much of your time i'm uh, last little topic here just before i get into some kind of leaving questions um i know you're pretty passionate about um like strength conditioning education with obviously what you yeah. what you've set up um how about we just talk quickly about the, um, like the state of S&C education? Like you mentioned at the very start, just to go full circle there, you did your, I think your master's degree was it in Bolton, you said? And it yeah. was like a good degree, but at the end of the day, it's just an expensive piece of paper. Um, where, where, more, so, more so the undergraduate. More so the undergraduate, yeah. yeah. So, but where is it, maybe we focus more on the undergraduate part of the degree here. Like, is the system broken? Like, how do we, if you were to yeah. break the system, like, how do, we, how do we go about changing that system? Okay, imagine you have a moderate medical or dental issue. Okay, you go into the doctor's surgery and they say, well, you, you've got like a you know, low, low level issue. You don't need a consultant for this. We're going to give you a student doctor and an intern. Are you okay with that? No. 
<laughs> you should you should be okay because you mate you, you, oh, you know got you, a, sorry a moderate condition yeah 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 okay okay, okay so okay, you yeah, you've yeah. experienced the nhs yeah you you go in every everyday medical issue student doctor just about to graduate mm-hmm. they'll see you write your prescription boom done yeah. you're happy with that right yeah okay put yourself in the same situation in sport are you happy to unleash a third year student or in america a fourth year student on a group of athletes no, no. <laughs> yeah, 99 times out of 100, no. Yeah. The, the difference between those two fields, do you agree that medicine is higher stakes and more significant than sport? Mm-hmm. So why, why can they do it and we can't? So the, yeah. the gap between those two is the indictment of education for high-performance sport. So you're saying we need to desensitize to a degree these coaches, these young coaches early on in their careers and combine, for lack of a better word, a more practical element earlier yes. on? Yes. Recent graduates in medicine, in, in complicated fields like medicine, dentistry, uh, manual trades, you know, if you're an electrician uh, hooking up um, the electric for a building, you know, that building can burn down. It's, it's not insignificant. It's a manual trade, but it's not insignificant. There's still a level of responsibility and expertise that you have to have. Mm-hmm. There is no problem in these fields of people coming off the conveyor belt of education and being ready to make an immediate impact in the environment that they're placed in with supervision. Yeah? 99 times out of 100, the, that graduate coming out of a sports science or exercise science program is like a crayon eater. They are not going to be able to make a meaningful impact immediately. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, 100%. I'm sure they're. I'm sure they're out there where they where they they are going to be able to do that. But in in the vast majority of cases, they're not. You have to spoon feed them and start again. Mm-hmm. That gap between what the environment demands and what allows you to thrive as a high performance coach and what the system teaches is the indictment of education for high performance sport. And speaking to a couple of people recently, I've come to the realization that the more academic the discipline, the more academia will prepare you. The more practical and skill-based the discipline, the less academia will prepare you. If you are going to be a student doctor, even though it's cerebral, what do they have you doing from day one? I mean, you're in the hospital. Yeah, you're interacting with patients yeah. and they're going to give you a task that is in line with your ability. Maybe you're just doing immunizations or you're doing this or you're doing that. They know in medicine that you have this skill set that you must be at this level in order to be a, a I think it's like a, uh, is it British Medical Council right. physician. You must be able to do this. And you're going to, you're going to demonstrate before we give you this piece of paper that you can do this in a practical setting. One, you understand the the theoretical underpinnings and two, you can do it in a safe manner in in the real world, okay? And they fail people. You can fail to become a doctor, right? Yeah. (laughs) Who knew? Yeah. Now look at strength and conditioning. You, someone could knock on my door tomorrow from from a college and say, what is it that you want new graduates to be able to know, understand and do. And I'll give them a list. Now instead, what happens is, the researchers that don't make their living training athletes dictate the curriculum. Or there's just this love in between the accrediting bodies and the academic institutions. Well, we think this is important. Okay, we're gonna certify people in that. And then the certification bodies say, well, we're gonna test this. And then they teach that. St. Mary's, London, uh, Twickenham, have a module exclusively on Olympic lifting. Is that because it's important or because the UK CA assessment tests it? You guess, yeah. <laughs> Bingo, all right? So the curriculum doesn't work backwards from what the environment demands. And then there's some hand-wringing about, well, you know, not everybody wants to work in elite sport and blah, blah, blah. I personally think it's BS. And if that is the case, you just need to specialize the degree more. Yeah. Um, in, term, in terms of that, I know, I think when I first came through, like when I was at university, there wasn't specialized S&C courses at undergrad. Yeah. 
now there is i'm pretty sure um, yeah so for like, good reason yeah you, you're doing snc undergrad degree because you want to be an snc coach right yeah you, you yeah need to specialize <laughs> yeah and i think the the major barrier is going to be that oh he's you know it's he's not a graduate or it's difficult to scale the apprenticeship model if universities had to adopt an apprenticeship model for coaching, they wouldn't be able to sell as many courses as they do because there's huge oversubscription in the field. Yep. And it's hard to standardize that. Yeah. The reason the ASCA evaluation process is better than the NSCA is because it's not a piece of paper exam. Yeah. But the NSCA certifies a lot more people than the ASCA. So whoever is able to take the plunge and effectively start up a trade school or an apprentice scheme mm -hmm. for strength and conditioning coaches, in my opinion, I believe I could be wrong, will produce vastly more prepared and productive high performance coaches than the traditional university system. But organizations are going to turn their nose up, but he doesn't have a degree. Mm -hmm. You know, do you know TK, Terrence Cannell? Yeah. yeah. He was when he came to me, he was in the last episode. Okay, TK interned for me in Japan, didn't even finish his degree yet. I didn't know. I didn't one, of the best in, one of the best interns I ever had because he was a self-starter and he was training athletes already. Right. Yeah. Now, if I put my traditional hat on, I should say that TK should be one of the worst interns I've ever had because he didn't have that piece of paper and accreditation. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. And is, how do you think we get around that then? Because that's obviously an issue, right? if you don't have that piece of paper and now more than likely if you don't have two pieces of paper being the undergrad and the masters, yeah. then you don't have your certification, then that's your barrier to entry. You cannot get in. Yep. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's almost like free money for the institutions. Mm -hmm. So this is where I've, you know, I've spoken to people about like uh, market dynamics and stuff like that. Supply versus demand. Mm -hmm. When supply exceeds demand, competitors within the marketplace begin an arms race to try and outcompete the other person. So 20, 20 years ago, how many strength coaches were there relative, let's say in the UK, thousand jobs fixed. Agreed? Yeah. If that, right? Yeah. Thousand full-time uh, strength conditioning jobs. How many sports science graduates are there a year in the UK? 10,000. How many of those are really serious about being a strength coach? Let's say a thousand. Okay. Multiply that by 20 years. You've now got 20,000 strength coaches for a thousand jobs that have not grown in, in step with that. They've grown because now everyone wants, you know, high school, we're, we have bought a hammer and we're going looking for nails. Oh, you can be a strength coach in this environment. You can be a strength coach in this environment, but there's still more supply than demand. So if you've got a degree, what am I now going to do? You got to go elsewhere. No, I'm going to go get a master's degree. Oh, don't, hire that, don't hire that guy. Yeah, I've got yeah, a master's yeah. degree. Yeah. 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 Well, then you've got it, but now uh, what I've noticed as well is obviously it's undergrad, masters, accreditation, yeah. shit, can't still, still can't get a degree, PhD. Yeah. Yes. And Don't know. Then what? He, he's, worked, he's worked a year full time unpaid. What am I going to do? Two yeah. years. Yeah. 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 Someone so, they said they've been interning for the last like five years. I was like, wow. Yeah. Like, like unpaid. I'm now, like, like shit. <laughs> it is what it is. Okay. It is what it is. However, the, the field and the gatekeepers to the field have to be very honest and upfront with people about the reality of the field that they are trying to gain entry to. Okay, so again, if you read Peter Thiel, he used to offer people a hundred grand to drop out of college and start a business. For real. Wow. Because his thing is, the university system is a Ponzi scheme. Okay. From an economic perspective, the reason that you go to university is you look at the average earnings of somebody that didn't go to university. Let's say 200 grand lifetime. It's, it's a, just a, a number pulled out of the sky, 200 grand. Okay. Then you look at the income of a person that went to university, 300 grand. What is that degree worth? Hundred grand, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. What should I pay for that degree? 
anything up to and including a hundred grand. Uh-huh. Okay. Cause that's, yeah. So basically whatever the lifetime earnings of a graduate above an undergraduate are, let's say it's a hundred grand, you should pay anything up to and including a hundred grand for that degree because it's a return on investment. Let's say the degree costs 50 grand. You spend 50, you get a hundred back. You've doubled your, your return. Look at the field of strength and conditioning. How much does a degree cost now? Let's say 50 grand to go and earn 10 grand a year working, you know, with a master's degree, the return on the investment is not there. So if you are doing it for economic reasons, do not go to university to study strength and conditioning and get a master's degree and all this, because you're not going to make that money back. If you want to make money, go do a manual trade, be a plumber. You know, I had to write my plumber a check for two and a half grand recently. I'm not writing those checks for strength coaches. So yeah. you just have to be aware the level of you're probably paying to be a strength and conditioning coach overall. Yeah. That's how I'd sum it up. But then we do it for the love of it, don't we? <laughs> we do. Try to try and feed your son a love sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> tough. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. I appreciate that. You've obviously, we've been on here a little bit now. Um, just finally, what advice would you give? I know we're touching actually quite a lot related to this question. What advice would you give to, to a young coach? I think I know what you're going to say here as well. <laughs> or get yourself a membership to strengthcoachnetwork.com. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just finally, where can people, uh, if they don't follow you already, where can people find you on like social media? Or, you know, just search uh, Rugby Strength Coach on any of the platforms. I'll probably pop up. Perfect. All right, Q, well, I'll, I'll leave it there because my computer is wanting to, to restart. And uh, <laughs> we'll end we'll it do, today. Hopefully we can do a, a part two at some point. Um, depending on how, how this virus goes out, hopefully, well, hopefully we get back sooner rather than later. So we'll if the world hasn't ended, yeah. Cheers. Really. Thanks a lot. Cheers, mate. Appreciate it. Good.